Hello and welcome to another ICS Impulse video. I'm Wendy Crumley Welsh, the Product Manager for ICS Impulse. Today we'll be talking about analysis for head impulse testing. So first thing we're going to look at is why and how we do head impulse testing. So why? The head impulse test is a site of lesion specific test that detects disorders of the vestibular ocular reflex and identifies which ear and which semicircular canal is affected in cases of peripheral vestibular loss. How do we do it? Well, we recommend that it's the first step towards diagnosis and subsequently early treatment. Since the head impulse test is quick and won't produce an adverse patient reaction, it's recommended that the test be performed at the beginning of the assessment workflow. Let's quickly talk about the difference between head impulse testing and caloric testing. Head impulse testing, again, is a cytal lesion specific test, so it's going to tell you whether it's the left lateral canal, the right lateral canal, the left anterior canal, the right anterior canal, etc. Caloric is ear specific. The head impulse test detects abnormalities in all six semicircular canals in cases with peripheral vestibular loss. So it can look at the lateral canals, the anterior canals, and the posterior canals, and each one of those canals independently. The caloric detects cases of peripheral vestibular loss in the lateral semicircular canal. So it can only look at the lateral canals, whereas head impulse can look at all six. Head impulse test tests with stimuli replicating the patient's everyday situation. So it's a physiologic stimulus. It's how we use the vestibular ocular reflex in every day. You walk to the end of the street, you look both ways, you're using your vestibular ocular reflex to make sure there's no traffic, and then you cross. The caloric, however, tests at a low frequency, approximately 0.025 hertz, so not at a frequency that we use in every day. The head impulse test has the ability to test patients even if they have middle ear disorders. On the caloric, if the patient has a middle ear disorder, it may prohibit performing the test. As we know with calorics, when we're trying to look at a unilateral weakness, we need to make sure that both ears anatomically are the same. You can't have one with middle ear effusion and one without, or one with a mastoidectomy and one without. Those two ears need to be similar in order to compare them and to get your unilateral weakness. With head impulse testing, that's not the case. You can do the test no matter what the middle ear disorder is for one ear or both ears. The head impulse test has the ability to test patients who do not tolerate calorics, such as young children, elderly, or patients with severe hearing loss. With calorics, as we know, some patients will not tolerate caloric testing and will not allow the caloric test to be completed. And the head impulse test stimulus does not persist between tests. That means I can do a head impulse and then quickly do another head impulse right afterwards. The caloric stimulus can persist between irrigations, especially if not performed properly. This is why we say you should wait three to five minutes between each caloric and between temperatures. So let's talk about head impulse test results. So the first thing we're going to talk about is a normal result. So what does a patient with normal limit, within normal limits exhibit? Well, first thing is they may have a few saccades, but nothing of significance. And that's the first thing we look at. Are saccades present or absent? The second thing is the gain. And this compares the eye and the head movement. So a gain of greater than 0.8 for lateral is within normal limits, and a gain of 0.7 for LARP and RALP is within normal limits. Now, that's from 0.8 or 0.7 up to 1.2. Gains greater than 1.2 are not within normal limits. And then spontaneous nystagmus. This may be present or absent, but what we're looking for is, is there a presence of saccades and is the gain abnormal? So what about patients with overt catch-up saccades? Now what is an overt catch-up saccade? An overt saccade is a corrective saccadic eye movement or catch-up saccade after the head impulse stops. So you do the head impulse, the patient should be looking straight ahead at the fixation dot, their eyes go with the head, and then when the head impulse stops, the eyes move back to the fixation dot. That's called an overt catch-up saccade. And it's typically identified with the naked eye. So when you do visual observation head impulse testing, you can typically see these overt catch-up saccades. So again, the first thing we look at is presence or absence of saccade. If the patient has a saccade, that's not normal. Second thing is gain. So if a patient has overt catch-up saccades, typically the gain is less than 0.8 for lateral, so anything less than 0.8 is abnormal, and for LARP and RALP, anything less than 0.7 is abnormal. Now 0.1 to 0.8 for lateral and 0.1 to 0.7 for LARP and RALP is typical of a unilateral loss. 
With a bilateral loss, typically the gain will be less than 0.1 for both the right and the left side. And spontaneous nystagmus may be present or absent. So to understand the over at ketchup saccades, we're going to look at a video here on headandpulse.com. So there's a rightward head movement, and you see the ketchup saccade. There's the saccade. There it is again. There it is again. There it is again. So it's pretty obvious that this person has ketchup saccades. And then they're going to show you in slow motion as well. So head turns, eye looks back to the fixation dot. One more time, rightward, head's turned, and eye looks back. But as you see, even with the regular recording, the regular speed, an overt ketchup saccade is very easy to see with the naked eye. Okay, the next thing we want to talk about is covert ketchup saccades. So what is a covert ketchup saccade? A covert corrective saccadic eye movement is a ketchup saccade that happens during the head impulse. So you're doing the head impulse, the eyes move away from the fixation dot, but go back to the fixation dot before that head impulse stops. And these cannot be identified with the naked eye. They're missed by visual observation. The way they were found was based on scleral search coil data. So with these, the gain is the same as with overt, less than 0.8 for lateral and less than 0.7 for LARP and RALP is abnormal. 0.1 to 0.8 or 0.1 to 0.7 for LARP and RALP is unilateral loss and less than 0.1 is typical of a bilateral loss. Spontaneous may be present or absent. So let's look at this video in, on headimpulse.com that shows us what covert ketchup saccades look like. And what you'll see is you won't be able to see them when the video is performed at the normal speed, but as they slow down the video, you will be able to see those covert ketchup saccades. So really look, can you see the ketchup saccade? It's very hard to see with visual observation. Now they're going to slow down the video, head moves, now the rightward, head moves, and there's the ketchup saccade. Now let's look at some data. Here you have normal, overt, and covert. So over here, if we look at the normal, you see the eye in the green and the head in the orange color and see that they match up perfectly. The eye is laying on top of the head. And if you look over here at the gain, the gain is 0.99 and it's within the normative data range. So the two bars, the upper bar and the lower bar, that is the age normative data. And the, the bars change based on the age of the patient that you put into the uh, system. So the mean gain is 0.99, standard deviation of 0.07. If we look at an overt saccade, patient with overt saccades, then you see here, here are all the overt saccades, and notice that they are to the right of the head movement. They're nowhere close to the head movement, and that's what makes them overt saccades. So these are ketchup saccades that happen after the head movement has stopped. So the head is in blue, the eye is in green, and then if you look over here, the mean gain, which is this X here, the mean gain is 0.51, and it's in the green region. And also notice that it's not within the two bars of, for the age normative data. So the, what this is showing you is that this gain is abnormal, or the VOR response is abnormal, and there's indication of over ketchup saccades. And the standard deviation is 0.14. Then you have an example of coverts. And typically coverts will be a mixture of covert and overt. So the head is in orange. This is a right word head movement. Eye is in green. And you see all these ketchup saccades. Now notice, see how they're right on top of the head here. That's why they're covert saccades. Now what sometimes happens is that the person will throw a covert saccade and then just need to do another little mini correction and will throw an overt further out. And that basically means they're correcting towards the target when the head is moving, but they don't just get it perfect. So then they do a little correction, another little overt to make sure they're looking right on the target. So oftentimes you'll see coverts 
followed by some lower amplitude overts. And if we look here at the gain, we have a mean gain of 0 0.32. Again, the bars here are saying that there's nothing in the, in the, between the two bars. This is in the gray region, and this is clearly abnormal or a low gain for the uh, VOR, the vestibular ocular reflex. And the standard deviation is 0 0.08. Let's talk about the spontaneous nystagmus. So I told you spontaneous nystagmus could either be present or absent. So what does a patient with spontaneous nystagmus exhibit? Well, spontaneous nystagmus, due to acute peripheral vestibular loss, beats in the direction of the healthy ear. Head impulses to the affected side have spontaneous nystagmus beats in the same direction as the ketchup saccade. So what does that mean? So let's look here. We do a leftward head impulse. So this is an example of a patient that has a left-sided abnormality. So what we see here is that if we do a head impulse to the left, not only do we have ketchup saccades, but we've got spontaneous nystagmus spikes as well. So when you do a head impulse to the left, the eyes move to the right. And what we said was that spontaneous nystagmus will beat towards a healthy ear. Well, the right side's a healthy ear, so that spontaneous nystagmus is beating to the right, but our ketchup saccade is also going to the right. So you move the head to the left, the eyes go with the head, and then the eyes move back to the right to go back to the fixation dot. So when we do a leftward head impulse, what we see is that the spontaneous nystagmus spikes and the ketchup saccades are all in the trace together. And as you can see over here with the gain, the left side is in the abnormal range. Now let's look at the healthy side. So spontaneous nystagmus, again, beats towards a healthy ear, so it should be beating rightward. When we do head impulses to the healthy side, we have spontaneous nystagmus that beats in the opposite direction, or downward. So I do a head impulse to the right, the ketchup saccade, if they had one, would be leftward. Now they don't have a right side abnormality, so they don't have any ketchup saccades. But what we do have beating is rightward spontaneous nystagmus. So those are the spikes that are going downward here. And what we see in the gain is that the right gain is within normal limits. So those spontaneous nystagmus is beating rightward. If we would have ketchup saccades, they would be beating leftward or upward. And we don't have any ketchup saccades because the right side is normal. So what should you do if a patient has spontaneous nystagmus? Well, when you're testing the patient, you want to check the spontaneous nystagmus box that you see right here on the left side. This uses a different algorithm for head impulse acceptance. If you don't check it, chances are most of the head impulses will be rejected because the spontaneous nystagmus interferes with the algorithm. So by checking that box, you let the algorithm be more free to accept data. So it's a little more lenient. Now, let's say that you're doing a bunch of head impulses and everything's rejecting and you're wondering why and you thought, oh, I forgot to check that spontaneous nystagmus box. Well, as long as you have raw data saved, then you can come in and go into reanalysis and check the spontaneous nystagmus then and it will reanalyze the data as if you would have checked it at the beginning and you don't have to sit there and recollect all that data. Okay, so there's two ways to do it. At the beginning, which is best, and then if you happen not to check it, you can do it after the fact and reanalyze. Now, where do you turn on that raw data? It's in your options. So head impulse options, there's a checkbox up at the top left corner that says save raw data. You have to have the save raw data on in order to be able to reanalyze the spontaneous nystagmus. And now we're going to talk about understanding analysis. So the first thing to understand is the most important thing is presence and absence of saccades. This by far outweighs gain. So always look at presence or absence of saccades first in your 2D analysis and your 3D analysis. And also you will see the saccades in your hex plot. Then look at the gain graph, which has normative data. It has the age normative data at the top, uh, the red being the right and the blue being the left. And then it also has the gray areas. So the dark gray at the bottom is a bilateral loss. The light gray is a unilateral loss. And then the white is within normal limits. 
We're going to talk about the hex plot. We're going to talk about playback. We're going to talk about the info tab. And then we're going to talk about comparing multiple test sessions, the progress graph and progress data. So first, again, saccades is the most important thing. Are there saccades present? So when you look at the data, now you can change these colors, but these are the default colors. The red is the saccade and the green is the VOR. On the right side, sorry, on the left side, the head is blue. On the right side, the head is kind of a salmon color. So here you can see that on the left side, there are saccades for the lateral, anterior, and posterior canals. For the right side, there are no saccades present. So this is indicative of a unilateral loss. And you can see the left lateral is a very good example where you have these beautiful saccades, covert and overt saccades here, and then you've got this reduced VOR compared to the head movement. And then you see the same data over here in 3D. And one thing that Dr. Hamagi always mentions is look for the canyon. And here, this is a beautiful example. You've got that big canyon there between the head and the eye. And so, and down here, you can see the canyon between the head and the eye. Okay, so some, these are the things you look for. Are there saccades present or are they absent? And then the gain graph, like I just said before, white is within normal limits, gray is abnormal, and then you've got the age normative data. And the references for the age normative data are in the manual. So there's been publications um, on the age normative data by Lee McGarvey um, and others. So the blue is the left side, the red is the right side, the X's are the mean, and all the individual dots are the individual head impulses. So the gain is the ratio of the eye movement velocity to the head movement velocity. Again, red is right, uh, the blue is the left, and we use area under the curve to assess for gain. We do not use instantaneous gain because we believe area under the curve is more accurate, especially for LARP and RALP. Peak velocity, the maximum velocity representing the particular head impulse is shown down in the status bar as well as in the info tab. So we will talk about that and I'll show you that in the software. I've already mentioned the normative data um, again. Now the cutoffs for the gray and the white area can be changed in the options uh, tab. So the test options and then go to the head impulse tab. And then asymmetry is also shown. Let me go back and point that out. See right here where it says relative asymmetry? So asymmetry is shown in um, the gain graph as well as in the hex plot. And the asymmetry is based on, the default asymmetry is based on a publication from Newman Toker et al. But in the test options, in head impulse tab, you have the option of using this asymmetry calculation or John Key's asymmetry calculation. So one thing to know is that in the 2D graph, the asymmetry calculation is based on left lateral to right lateral, left anterior to right posterior, and right anterior to left posterior. So in the gain graph, it's based on the plane. When we talk about the hex plot, we calculate based on the um, where the canal is located. Okay. So know that there's two different asymmetry calculations. The one in the gain graph is based on the plane. So left anterior to right posterior, right anterior to left posterior. So now the hex plot. In the hex plot, you've got quite a bit of information here. First at the top, you've got your two anterior canals, left anterior, right anterior. Then you've got your lateral canals, left lateral, right lateral. And then you've got your posterior canals, left posterior, right posterior, and the traces for all six of those canals. Then in the middle, you've got the hex plot. And so what this hex plot is showing you is the orange, the gain is low, and in the green, the gain is within the normal limits. Okay. Now, if you look at each one of these boxes, you're wondering, well, what's these little green, blue, and orange um, bars? Well, the green means that that saccade data was within normal limits or was considered normal when you or there's no saccades present in that data when you look at the blue the blue is telling you that the saccades are gathered together so look here is your legend in the ketchup saccade analysis you've got normal gathered and scattered so the lateral and the right posterior the saccades are gathered together 
And then if you look at the left posterior, the saccades are all over the place and they're scattered. So it's important to look at this, and this is very new information. We're going to talk about ketchup saccade analysis. Um, but what this may be telling you is that as the patient compensates for their disorder, their saccades are less likely to be scattered and more likely to be gathered. So that's one thing that people are starting to look at is not only the presence of saccades, the amplitude of the saccades, the latencies of the saccades, and then whether these saccades are gathered together or scattered as to how is the patient actually um, compensating for their disorder and are their symptoms improving? Are they doing better? Even though their head impulse results may not be considered within normal limits. So again, the hex plot, the green bar, the mean gain is within normal limits. The orange bar means the gain is low. And the other color, the mean gain bar can be is yellow if the gain is high. We talked about asymmetry ratio in the gain graph. Again, in this one, it's calculated a little differently. It's the same um, formula. So the default is the Newman-Toker um, formula, which is a relative gain asymmetry. Or you can choose John Keys. Um, so you have that option in uh, the test options. But in the hex plot, we actually compare the asymmetry ratio anterior to anterior, lateral to lateral, and posterior to posterior. So the canal, not the plane. So ketchup saccade analysis. Um, we actually worked with Dr. Ray and Dr. Perez. Um, and as you see, there's a reference here for the ketchup saccade analysis. Um, but we worked very closely with uh, the Spanish team to develop this really nice tool. Um, so what you have here is you have six columns for your six canals, left lateral, right lateral, left anterior, right posterior, right anterior, left posterior. You can choose just to display this overall um, summary, which is the first three lines, or you can choose to display everything. And again, that's in the test options, head impulse tab. But what this is telling you at the top here is the percentage of head impulses that had a saccade in them, either overt or covert. So in the left lateral, 92% of the head impulses had a saccade. Right lateral, 100% of the head impulses had a saccade. For the anteriors, none of them had a saccade. And for the posteriors, 100% had a saccade. Then this PR score is giving you a coefficient of variance. And this is described in the manual. And then the next thing is the classification. Was the data was that canal considered normal, gathered, or scattered? And normal meaning within normal limits. And all normal means here is that there's no saccades present. Okay. For the head data, it gives you the average latency for the head, for the peak of the head movement. What was the latency of the peak of the head movement? And then the amplitude of the head movement. So that's your amplitude there, degrees per second. And amplitude, it's basically the same number for peak velocity. So when you see an amplitude in the ketchup saccade and in the info tab, then down at the bottom of the status bar, you might also see peak velocity. So that is the same number. But this is an average. The average amplitude for all the left lateral head impulses performed. The average left uh, amplitude for all the right lateral head impulses performed. Next thing we look at is, were there any covert saccades occurring? So for us, covert saccades happen 70 milliseconds to when the head crosses the zero line, the zero crossing. So if it's happening in that time frame between 70 milliseconds and the zero crossing, then it's counted as a covert. So in the left lateral example, there were no covert saccades. And if we keep going down in this column, 92% were all overt saccades. The average latency for those saccades was 199 milliseconds. The amplitude was 156 degrees per second. And then the coefficient variance was 24. In the right lateral, if we look, 6% of the saccades were covert. 93% were overt saccades. And then we've got latency and amplitude for the coverts latency, and amplitude for the overts. Um, if we go over to, let's go over to right posterior. Again, nothing for coverts. And even in the left posterior, nothing for coverts. We had 100% of those being overt saccades. 
and then there's their latency and their amplitude and the PR score. So this information all can be exported um, in your um, ASCII file so that you can do research or you can be looking at this, you can be monitoring the patient so they come in, they're acute, then you do some rehab, are they getting better, is the latency getting shorter, um, these are things to look at and are those saccades becoming more gathered than scattered. Now, if you have old data and you want to have the catch-up saccade analysis, you need to reanalyze that old data. If you have raw data saved, all you have to do is click the reanalyze button. If you do not have raw data saved, if it's really old data and there's no raw data saved, what you're going to need to do is choose left, move the baseline amplitude, then click restore defaults, and then choose right, move the baseline amplitude, click restore defaults, and that will actually reanalyze your data for you. It's not as nice as if you do have the re uh, the raw data, um, but it will at least reanalyze your data and populate the catch-up saccade analysis properly for old data that's been collected prior to 4.0. So I think this is just a fabulous uh, new feature in the ICS Impulse, and I think we're going to learn a lot from this data that is being collected. So the other cool thing is playback, and this is really nice too. So we're going to talk about playback old data and playback new data. So if you have old data and there's you uh, either didn't save the video or you didn't save the raw data, let me talk about what will play back. So the video, your video used to be stored under video record and playback. Not anymore. All those head impulse videos will now be under this videos tab and you can play back those videos separately. If you have um, raw data saved, then you can play back the old data um, up here. And what that will basically allow you to do is scroll through the trace. You won't be able to use these play buttons, but you can scroll through the trace, highlight a head impulse, put your cursor on the head impulse, see where it was on the training curve, see the highlighted trace here, and then it'll circle the gain graph for you. The, gra the gain point for you, which is right over here. There's a little circle there. Um, so the old data, that's the way you can go back and review it and look at it head impulse by head impulse, see the traces, see the 3D, or sorry, the 2D analysis, and then the video you would play back separately. In the new data, completely different ball game. Um, this is really cool because I'm gonna, we're going to go into software. I'm going to show you how you um, play back that data. So let's do that now. Let's go over here and let's hit play. And you will see how... So what you actually see here is that as I do a head impulse, the real-time trace is going. You see the trace on the uh, training curve. You see it highlighted in the 2D. You see the gain circled in the gain graph. Let's keep playing that. You see the eye movement. And if you have webcam hooked up, your synchronized room video, then you also see the room video as well. So now you can use the synchronized room video along with the head impulse test. So this is a fabulous way to look at that data. So if you are not the person um, collecting the data and you have someone else collecting the data for you, you can uh, easily review the data um, afterwards. Or even if you collect it yourself and you want to go back and look at it later, you can do so. So I think that is just a fantastic feature. Let's talk about test info. So the info tab has changed just a little bit and we reorganized it and try to make it a lot nicer. But now, so in the catch-up to cut analysis, those are averages of all the head impulses. Maybe you wanna look at one particular head impulse. And so what you do is you go in your 2D traces 
uh, you know you can click on the graph and use your up and down arrows to go through each trace and you highlight one. For that one trace, it gives me over here the gain, which is 0.61, the head latency, which is 48 milliseconds. So this is occurring, the peak right here is occurring at 48 milliseconds. The amplitude, it was 217 degrees per second. See, and see down here, it says amplitude here, it says peak velocity here. Um, so same thing, 217 degrees per second. This is down in your status bar, and your gain is also shown down in your status bar. And then for the saccade, you've got one saccade, sorry, two saccades, one saccade here, two saccades here. The first saccade is at 148 milliseconds. The amplitude is 233 degrees per second. The second saccade is at 200, or sorry, 320 milliseconds. 122 degrees per second is the amplitude. And then if you had a third saccade, it would show that as well. But in this trace, we do not have a third saccade. So you get the head movement and the saccades for that individual trace. Now, while we're in here, I want to also talk about the collection and analysis. So ideally, these should be identical. Now, this is very good data because there's only one that got rejected in analysis that was different from what was rejected in collection. Um, but what I want to point out here is, and what is new in 4.0 is that you have the left and right rejects. So before we just had total rejects, now you know exactly how many were rejected on the left, how many rejected on the right. And then you've got your average frame rate and your calibration. And Ketchup saccade parameters modified. That means that if I moved the baseline amplitude or the um, the starting position, um, then it would say ketchup saccade parameters modified. Okay, so we just talked about this. Your analysis numbers give you your total for accepted and rejected for left and right. What passed the collection? What passed the analysis? And this is, and what is in an analysis uh, column is what is displayed on the 2D and 3D graphs. What's in the collection column is what occurred on the collection screen when you were performing the test. Regarding frames per second, that's the average frame rate. If the frame rate drops below 219 during data collection, that head impulse will automatically be rejected. And then we talked about the head and saccade info for the highlighted trace. Now progress graphs. So progress graph will show you, um, you can highlight uh, multiple tests and compare. So if I had two lateral tests and I wanna look at the 3D information for those two lateral tests, even if they were on different test session dates, um, I can do so. And then progress data allows me to look at the gain. And so what this shows me here, over here in the lateral, so this tells me lateral at the top here, then there was this test session done on uh, 5.16 and the next test session done on 8.6. And then, so each set of data is here. They're each different colors. And then it also shows me my standard deviation bars. So let's look at patient data. Okay, so I'm here in the Otosuite vestibular software that's used with the ICS Impulse. And I'm gonna search, cause I know all of my patient data demo data has the first name data. So I can easily search in our patient list. So let's look at a normal first. We already have the normal pulled up. So we're gonna to go to head impulse here. And what we see here is, what do we need to look for first? Are there ketchup saccades or not? So we look here and we don't see any red spikes. So we know that all the traces are, that there's no ketchup saccades present. So they're within normal limits. And if I look at the gains, all the gains are close or in the white region. So that's all within normal limits. Now let's look at the 3D analysis. So if I wanted to look at these in 3D and let's just take the lateral and, and make that big, I can then rotate these and look and see at the, the data here. And what I want to see in a normal is that the head and the eye are on top of each other, which they are. And then the last thing if I want to look at is the hex plot. So again, this was new for version 2.0, but we can see here, if I quickly look at the hex plot, everything's green, everything's within normal limits. Now let's look at some abnormal data. So again, I'll search data, and let's start with the overt ketchup saccade. Now, the overt and the covert were collected 
um, before we had LARP and RALP. But you can see here in version 2.0, I've got these beautiful red spikes that are my overt ketchup saccades. So I'm just going to, I can use my up and down arrows once I click in that window and I can go through each one of these um, impulses. So if I see here, this is a, one impulse, the blue is the head, the green is the VOR, the red is the spike, and over here where the gain point is circled, that's the gain for that one trace. So I can search through all of these independently, but you can easily see that those ketchup saccades happened after the head stopped and so those are over at ketchup saccades. If we look over here on the right, all these downward spikes are actually spontaneous nystagmus. Okay, but the right side is normal. Now let's go back to our patient list and let's look at somebody who has covert ketchup saccades. So again, first thing we look for, are there any ketchup saccades? And yes, there are. So the right side is actually the abnormal side. But the right side is so abnormal, it actually pulls down the good side, which is the left side, and that's very typical. But as you see here, that first ketchup saccade is occurring during the head movement. And sometimes what you'll see is more than one ketchup saccade as they're trying to get back to that fixation dot. So we have these covert ketchup saccade, and then we have a little one, a little overt following it. So we can go through, we can see that there's obviously ketchup saccades occurring during the head movement, so that's an example of covert. And you can look over in the gain graph and see which gain is circled for each one of those points. The other thing to point out is down at the bottom, you will see the gain for that particular head impulse. So this one is 0 0.27 and the peak velocity for that particular head impulse. So this peak velocity was 116 degrees per second. So that's how quickly the head was moved during the head impulse test. Let's go back to our patient list. And you can also see up here that asymmetry was 56%. So there's a significant difference between the right and the left side. So let's go search data again. And let's look at a unilateral loss. So this one we saw before. What we see is the left side's abnormal, the right side is normal, the red is in the white region of the gain graph, the blue is in the gray region of the gain graph, and we've got these beautiful spikes. Let's go in and let's look at this in 3D. So one thing Michael Hamagi says to look for is the canyon, and actually the left anterior is a good example of this. But see this big canyon or difference between like a hole between the head movement, which is the blue, and the eye movement, which is the green. So if you see that canyon, that's where the gain is not working appropriately. The, the eye is obviously different from the head. So again, you can turn all these around and look at them however you want, and if you want to put them right back where they were, you just hit the reset button. And then if we go to hex plot and look, we can see again the left side is abnormal and the right side is normal. Okay, let's go back to our list and let's look at a bilateral loss. So here we go. We have got ketchup saccades in all six canals. Right and left lateral, right and left anterior, and right and left posterior. And all of the gains are in the gray region. And let's go and look at this in 3D. And we can see that beautiful canyon that Dr. Hamagi talks about in his talks. So you can see them in all of these. Ooh, we went a little too far. There we go. All of these traces. See that there? And then this one around here. There you go. So we've got this beautiful canyon for all six of the canals. And obviously, this person has ketchup saccades and a very reduced function of their vestibular ocular reflex. And if we go to the hex plot, we can see everything's orange and small. So that's abnormal. Now, let's look at some more interesting cases here. Let's look at a superior neuritis. So what should we expect from a superior neuritis? If you remember your anatomy and physiology, the lateral and anterior canal are innervated by the superior vestibular nerve. So what we should see, and this is an example of a left abnormality, is the left lateral and the left anterior have ketchup saccades, which we see here. Left posterior and the whole right side are within normal limits, no ketchup saccades. And then if we look at the gain graph, we see that the right side 
for all three canals as in the normal range and the left lateral left anterior are in the gray range and the left posterior is in the white range so we have abnormality in the lateral and anterior canal if we go to the hex plot again what does this tell us quickly we've got left anterior and left lateral abnormality and everything else is normal and in the green now let's look at inferior vestibular neuritis so again your anatomy what should we see here well the left side's normal but the right side has a right posterior abnormality and again your posterior canal is innervated by the inferior vestibular nerve. So what we should see here is that there's no ketchup saccades in the left side and that the gain is in the white region. The right side for lateral and anterior no ketchup saccades gain in the white region but what we have here posterior we've got these ketchup saccades here beautiful ketchup saccades and our right gain is in the gray region. And let's go to hex plot and what do we see there? Right posterior is orange that's abnormal everything else is green so and we can go to the 3d as well and see that we've got that canyon going on there's a gap there that you can see and then we've got these ketchup saccades let's go back to our patient list and data and let's look at a Meniere's patient there has been reported by Dr. Leonardo Manzari and Ian Kerthois in some articles that they have seen this in patients with Meniere's that the gain is high so it's above 1.2 and we don't know why that occurs yet and it may be that there's differences between Meniere's patients some Meniere's patients exhibit this some may not but I want to show you this because it may be something that you see when using the ICS impulse so first let's talk about the left side so this person had had Meniere since they were 10 years old. They had had a vestibular neurectomy on the left side, but she still suffers from Meniere's on the right side. So what we see here in the left side is we get these beautiful covert saccades. So she's compensated. We believe she's compensated for her disorder, um, and that's why she's producing these covert saccades. But you can see the saccades are happening during the head movement. So beautiful covert saccades, but the gain is abnormal. Then when we look at the right side, so this is the one that's interesting. Notice that the eye is bigger than the head. So the green is bigger than the blue when I have the trace highlighted. And you can see this for every single one of the head impulses. And we look at the gain points and the gain points are above 1.2. In fact, her average is 1.31. Well, that's not normal. A normal person would be between 1.2 and 0 0.8. So this is something that has been reported to be seen uh, with patients who have Meniere's disease, that the eye is bigger than the head. If we go to the hex plot, what you see here is the left lateral is abnormal, it's an orange. The right lateral is yellow because the mean gain was above 1.2 and the other four were not collected. So let's go back to our patient list and we've got one more patient to look at and this is a vestibular migraine now we don't know a whole lot about head impulse and vestibular migraines but if you look here we've got lateral disorder we've got a right posterior and a left posterior well we know that's not superior neuritis because it would be anterior and lateral and it's not inferior neuritis because it would be posterior only so we don't know what we'll find with these vestibular migraine patients um, but I just want to show you some data you may see things that are unusual and this may help you with your diagnosis but vestibular migraine patients can vary in their results and if we go to the hex plot we'll see here we've got the lateral and the posterior canals abnormal and the anterior canals normal and the last thing is reanalysis this is new in version 2.0 so there's a couple of things you can do in reanalysis. We've already talked about spontaneous nystagmus. So that's right here at the top of the screen under the reanalysis tab that you could check that if you forgot to check it at the beginning. But the new thing is a ketchup saccade parameter reanalysis. So what this does is you have two slider bars, a baseline amplitude and a start position. 
So the baseline ap amplitude, the setting identifies the saccade based on how steep the slope of the back side of the saccade is. Adjust this slider if you believe an eye movement is misidentified as a saccade or that the eye movement should be identified as a saccade. And then the other option is the start position. So this setting determines where the software starts to look for the presence of a saccade. And again, if you believe that the algorithm didn't function properly, then you can change this. Now, no algorithm is out there is perfect, and sometimes your naked eye is a little bit better than the algorithm. And that's why we implemented this, so that if you believe that the algorithm um, did not perform properly, then you can reanalyze. So I'll show you an example of when this typically occurs and why we implemented this. So first, just to point out how the software works and the reanalysis in the baseline versus the amplitude. So here's an example of what looks like a covert saccade right on the top of the peak of the head movement. So why does this look like a covert saccade? It's a very steep or what Ian Kurthois would call like a stalactite type of shape. So a very steep pointy shape. And that's what we typically see with saccades. It's not a very broad shape um, or kind of rounded off. It's very steep and pointy. So that's what the algorithm looks for is, is there a ketchup saccade there? Now, based on the shape of this, one thing that it looks for is that it says, you know what? This looks like a ketchup saccade to me. Now, we call it covert because it's right on top of the head. Um, then if you look at the green, so what the algorithm does is the first thing it does is it desaccades before calculating the gain. So it's going to take that saccade out of the picture and then try to calculate the VOR gain and look at the gain between the eye and the head. So it thinks this is a saccade and so therefore it takes it out of the picture. The green is where the VOR is and then it compares the green to the blue and that's why the gain point, which is this little one circled here, is low. Now. Maybe based on the information I have with that patient, I don't believe, maybe I think this patient has been years, and I don't believe that that's really a covert saccade. That was just a normal eye movement for that patient. So then I could go in and reanalyze it. So let me point this out to you real quick. Start position, again, is where it starts to look for saccades. And baseline amplitude is the back end of that saccade, so how steep that is. So first thing I want to talk about is why does this data look this way? So the eye velocity is higher than the head velocity. So therefore we have these really high gains. And we've got these high gains not only on the left side but also on the right side. So the first thing you have to do is rule out goggle slippage. So was the strap not tight? Is there a gap between the face cushion and the skin? Were you using an old face cushion? The reason why these face cushions are disposable is because we want to make sure they fit well and they stay snug to the face. And so reusing them over and over and over again can often cause slippage. So were you using an old face cushion? Was the cable clip not attached to the right shoulder? Was the tester touching the goggle or the strap during the head impulse? Because if you touch it, you have the possibility of moving that goggle. Or, last thing is, is the patient have very compliant skin? So is it a really elderly patient where the skin on their face is a little bit on the loose side? So if you think that none of those things occurred, then we need to look at some other things. First thing is, is was that patient closer than a meter to the fixation dot? So we say you need to be a meter away because you don't want convergence of the eye. So you want to make sure that you're positioned appropriately. So if you're too close, you will get convergence and therefore the gain will be higher. The next thing is, is, hmm, was this really a Meniere's patient? Do we think this is similar to the data that's been reported? First thing is, is if you see the eyes leading the head in the real-time trace, stop and check the goggles in the patient's setup. Make sure that you're not doing any of those listed that could cause goggle slippage and that the patient is appropriately seated away from the fixation dot. And then, the la then if you think all of that's done, continue your test and then you've got to analyze your data as it is, but you've ruled out any kind of user error. So let's go into the software here and let's pull up this data that I'm showing you. So here's the way it comes in to me. I can look through these and I can see that obviously sometimes it's identifying this sharp peak above the head as a covert saccade. 
So if I believe that this is not the case, I can go to reanalysis. We choose the left side, and then I believe this is a baseline shift error. It's not where the peak is starting. It's really the sharpness of the back end of the peak is where it's saying, you know what, this is not just a no normal eye movement. This is a catch-up saccade. So what I can do is I can adjust. I'm going to slide it to the right. Adjust this slider until all of those peaks turn green. If I go the opposite direction here, if I thought these were all catch-up saccades, then I would adjust to the left and make the peaks turn red. But if I'm saying, you know what, I don't think these are catch-up saccades, then I can adjust these. And then I go back to my gain graph and all of the gains are high. Okay? So it will automatically fix your, recalculate your gains for you. Now, let's say you decided that you did this and you don't, you want to go back to the original. All you have to do is hit restore default and that goes back to what the algorithm believed is the correct result. So that's the way you reanalyze. It's very simple. You just need to make sure that you choose either right or left because you can do each one independently and then use the slider bars leftward or rightward to adjust the colors and then when you go to the gain graph it's recalculated your gain for you. So last thing, you can learn lots about ICS Impulse on icsimpulse.com through all the videos and you can learn a lot about the research behind the ICS Impulse on headimpulse.com. You can also find on headimpulse.com where speakers are speaking globally um, and both websites are a very great resource for you.